All right, everyone, we had uh, two homework questions last night, both on conservation of momentum. Uh, any issues with either of those questions on page 475 involving collisions or uh, these ones, not so much collisions, I guess, but more explosion type things where one object becomes two. Any issues with either of those? Yep. Number two. Okay. Number two says, a student standing on a stationary 2.3 kilogram skateboard, the student jumps at a velocity of 0.37. The velocity of the skateboard is 8.9. What's the mass of the student? We saw a question kind of like this yesterday, um, but it wasn't an explosion type question. It was a collision type question. Remember we had the, the car and the truck, and we had to find the mass of the truck. Kind of similar. A little bit different, though, too, at the same time. This is like an explosion. Okay, this is two, one object. It's the guy in the skateboard, or the girl in the skateboard, as the case may be, as one object. Then when the person jumps off the skateboard, the person goes one way, the skateboard goes the other way. One object becomes two. We said there's two situations, basically, where we can use conservation of momentum. We have a collision, and that's most of the problems that we've done yesterday and the day before with conservation of momentum, but also explosions, where one object becomes two. Literally, a bomb explodes, or not so literally, when a guy jumps off a skateboard. Let's identify some givens here. Let's make the skateboard mass one. Let's make the person mass two. Now, I can't remember if it was this class or the other class, but somebody said yesterday, um, since they're together, wouldn't we just have a combined mass instead of separating them as M1 and M2? The answer to that is no, not in our givens. We have to separate them in our givens because they're not together for the entire question. If there was a person on a skateboard holding a ball, and the person held the ball for the entire question and didn't let it go, then we would consider the mass of the person and the ball one object through the whole question. If the person stayed on the skateboard for the whole question, we would consider that one mass for the whole question. But the person is with one with the skateboard in the beginning of the question, but separates from the skateboard later on in the question. So because they're not together for the entire question, we have to make it two separate masses, at least in our givens. All right, what else do we have here? Um, we get a 0 0.37 meters per second. That's a V, right? That's a velocity. What is it? Is it V1 or is it V2? Let's do our little eye test again. V1 or V2? A student is standing on a skate, stationary skateboard. If the student jumps at 0.37 meters per second forward, V1 or V2? V2, good. The student jumps. We define the second mass as the mass of the student. Right, Tom? Can I hold it yet? Yeah, I know. Um, we define the mass of the student as M2. So this is the velocity of the student. It's going to be V2. Is it going to be V2I or V2F? Remember, the final is after the student jumps off. The initial is before the student jumps off. Okay, this velocity corresponds to the velocity of the student after he or she jumps off. We're going to call it V2F. Um, uh, we know what V1F is, the velocity of the skateboard. I missed this, though. I missed this the first time I read through it. Okay, it's backwards. I want to draw attention to that with an ugly highlighter or a red pen or something. I'm going to put in brackets here a negative just to draw, remind me again, to draw even more attention to it. Is there anything else we have if we read between the lines here? There is one more thing if we read between the lines. A student is standing on a stationary skateboard. Stationary means what? Something is zero, right? Some velocity is zero. It's not moving, right? But what velocity is it? It's zero. Oh, I'm sorry. V1 and V2, initial or final. Good. We're just going to call it VI, since they're both together before the collision or the explosion takes place. All right. So we're going to do PI as you go to PF. Remember what we said a dozen times now? We could analyze just the skateboard with impulse, or we could analyze just the student 
with impulse. Or we can analyze the whole system with conservational momentum. Okay, PI equals PF is conservational momentum. Let's, let's look at the system. Uh, the total initial momentum is zero. Because who said it? Bo said that the initial velocity is zero. Okay, nothing's moving. There is no momentum before the explosion takes place. The final momentum, M1, V1, F, plus M2, V2, F. Two objects, right? They separate, and we have two objects afterwards. M1 is 2.3 kilograms, and V1, F is negative 8.9 meters per second. Okay, if I end up with that uh, red circle and this little note here, I bet I'm about 75% sure I probably would have forgotten that negative. Okay? Um, that backward is almost buried in that question. Okay? It would be so easy to miss it for whatever reason, especially in this question. So draw attention to it. Remember that. Uh, what's the mass of the student? Uh, M2 times V2F. V2F is uh, 0.37 meters per second. This one's actually a little bit easier than that car truck question yesterday, right? We're solving for a mass instead of a velocity, which we usually solve for. But it's not a total mass from which I have to subtract the mass of something else. This is the mass that I get here is the mass that I want. OK, 2.3 times 8.9. Let's get the value of that and take it over to the other side by adding. Uh, that's 20.47. So that's on the left-hand side as a positive value, 0.37m2. Let's take the 0.37 over by dividing. And we get a value of 55.3, which rounded to two digits is exactly what they have in the answers there, 55 kilograms. Is that OK? Daniel, is that OK? How are we for number one, guys? We good with that one? Yeah? All right. Uh, I'm going to assign worksheet number three. However, if you have a lab due tomorrow, I understand that. I promised you at the beginning of the year that I'd be conscious of, of the amount of work that you have and other stuff that you have outside of school. Um, worksheet number three will be due for Monday. Okay? Worksheet number three will be due for Monday. We may have an opportunity to spend a few minutes working on it later in class as well. Not sure. But if we don't, you don't have to worry about doing it tonight. What I want to do right now is take a look at a couple multiple choice questions. The first one being multiple choice question number 10. OK, multiple choice question number 10. I'd like you to submit this, please. Submit this one to me as numerical response number one on the form on my website. All right, let's take a look here. It says a 2100 kilogram van collides with a 1200 kilogram car that is at rest. They lock together, they move off at a speed of 4.5. What's the initial speed of the van? Okay, we're going to say uh, mass one is the mass of the van, mass two is the mass of the car. We're going to say that V2I is zero. Okay, that's the mass of the car before the collision takes place. They lock together, move off at a speed of 4.5. We're going to call that VF. We're looking for V. 1i, the initial speed of the van. So let's say uh, pi is equal to pf, because we're analyzing the entire system here, not just one car. Conservation momentum applies, right, Simon? Uh, M1 v1i plus M2 v2i. They stick together, so it becomes mvf. 2100 times, uh, that's what we're looking for, v1i. This disappears. This disappears because the second car is initially at rest. The total mass after the collision takes place, since they lock together, is going to be 3,300 kilograms. And VF is going to be 4.5 meters per second. And I think everybody did this. What does the answer work out to be there? 70.7? Was that the answer? 70? Okay, well, let's, uh, let's do it here, since you guys are disagreeing. Let's say 2,100. Uh, no, sorry, let's say 3,300 
times 4.5 divided by 2100. 7.07, yeah. So I think what happened uh, for anybody to get 70.7 is they probably typed in um, like 33,000 or something like that or, or 45 or missed a decimal place somewhere. Okay. Uh, there, was, there was also an answer of 7.06. I'm not sure. Okay, so you, so you got 7.07? Yeah. Okay. Good? Okay. Let's do uh, question number 13, and let's submit that one, please, as multiple choice number one, please. All right, let's take a look here. Uh, interesting results here. We got uh, numbers kind of all over the place with your answers here. The only one that people didn't pick was option C. Uh, there was even some people that picked option E. I don't know. 13 says, an empty freight car of mass M coasts along a track at 2 meters per second until it couples to a stationary freight car of mass 2M. The final speed of the two freight cars immediately after the collision is what? Um, the only thing we actually have here as a, as a specific number is the velocity of one of the cars, 2.0 meters per second. So how are we supposed to do this if we don't actually know anything other than one velocity? Right? It's hard to have one given and then solve for something. Well, let's call, let's call that M1. Let's call that M2. We don't know what the number is, but we still know that that's the first mass and that's the second mass without the number, okay? Don't worry about that yet. Okay, we may run into trouble without knowing what the masses are, but we know how to, t we know how to start it, right? We know this is a collision. We know that PI is equal to PF. Let's start it that way. Okay, let's circle what we know and write down the givens of what we know. We know that M1 is M. Whatever that means, we know that it's M. We also know that V1I is 2 meters per second. We know that V2I is 0 because it's a stationary freight car. They stick together. We want to find VF, the final velocity of the two cars after the collision takes place. So let's write down, again, what we know, what we can do. We know that PI is equal to PF. We may not know where we're going with it because we're missing masses, but we know that this is what applies, so let's do it. There's two objects before the collision, M1 V1I plus M2 V2I. There's one object after the collision. Um, I'm going to call this, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it M, little m, but I'm going to call it MT this time. Why did I do that? Why did I put that subscript, subscript in? Usually I don't, right? Usually I just call it M, right? Tom, why did I make it MT this time? Yeah. It's a total mass, but, but often it's a total mass, and I usually just call it M. Why did I bother calling it MT this time? Yeah, I don't want to get it mixed up with M, right? M is already something. M is the mass of the first car. So I don't want to mix up the total mass with the mass of the first car. Let's call it something different here. Call it MT, okay, even though it's not what we usually call it. M1 is M. V1i is 2.0 meters per second. M2 is, well, it doesn't matter what M2 is because V2i is zero, so zero times whatever is zero. The total mass is what? 3m times Vf. Well, we still have two unknowns here, m and Vf. In m, the top it off is in two places. So what are we going to do, Tom? Yeah, how about let's just cross off M right now, right? Since it appears in every term, that leaves me with 2 is equal to 3 times VF. And then let's divide by 3. 0 0.667 meters per second. All right. So you start this question. You're not sure where to go with it because, I mean, I heard at least one person say, basically, what's the deal with that M? Right? You know, we, we don't know what to do with it. That's okay. Okay. Even I sometimes don't know exactly what to do with the question when I start the question. So I started with confidence doing what I know. Okay, that's exactly what we did here. We started with confidence doing what we know. Write down your givens as best as you can. PI equals PF because that's what applies. M1, V1, I, and so, and so on. Okay. And then we start plugging things in. And it's funny how oftentimes 
even when we're not sure exactly what's gonna, how we're going to actually solve it in the end, when we start a question, we're, we're sometimes not sure about that. It's funny how sometimes it just, if we're confident and we keep going with what we know, it, it just kind of falls into place. Like this, you know, we get to this point, oh wait, M's in every term, I can cancel that out. Okay, even if I didn't spot that ahead of time, okay, I get to this step and maybe I can spot it. All right? The good news is most people did pick, uh, most people did pick D. More than half of you picked D, but there was still a significant number of people that picked the other options as well. Uh, one more multiple choice question, and then we'll just move on with some new stuff here. This is number 14, and I'd like you to submit this one, please, as well as multiple choice number one. Okay, let's take a look here, everyone, guys. Uh, we had uh, all four options picked. There's 13 of you, and at least one person picked all four options. So let's see which one is actually correct here. It says, two boys, Ted and Larry, initially at rest, push each other apart on a frictional surface. Ted has a mass of 40, Larry has a mass of 60. After the boys push each other apart, Ted has a speed of 6. Uh, what speed is Larry? We don't know. As the boys move apart, Larry has, well, we want to compare the momentum and or kinetic energy. Okay, let's look at momentum first, because that's the easy one. If two boys are standing there and they push each other apart, one guy goes the one way, one guy goes the other way. What do we know about the momentum of Ted and Larry? It has to be the same. It was zero momentum when we started. It has to be zero momentum when we end. If Ted has five this way, then Larry must have five the other way to give me zero. So that means that A and B, without any calculations, A and B can't be the answer. It has to be either C or D, which, which precludes eight of you from being correct right now. Now let's look at kinetic energy. Um, should be easy enough to find kinetic energy, right? The only issue is we don't know what the speed of Larry is after, the expo after this explosion takes place. So what we're going to have to do is say PI is equal to PF and find the speed of Larry, and then we're going to have to calculate the kinetic energy of both of them to see. Uh, the initial momentum is zero. Uh, uh, Ted is 40 kilograms and has a velocity of 6. Larry is uh, 60 kilograms and has a velocity of whatever. Solve for V2F. I think it's going to work out to be negative 4 meters per second there. All right, so Larry has a speed of negative 4 meters per second. Let's calculate the kinetic energy of Ted. It's 1 half mv squared, 1 half of 40 times 6 squared. Uh, 36 times 20 is uh, 720. Let's find the kinetic energy of Larry now. Uh, 4 squared is 16. 16 times 30 is 480. So, Ted has more kinetic energy than Larry. That means Larry has less kinetic energy than Ted. The answer is D. Hmm, interesting. In a class of 13, three of you got it right. Was it? All right. As, uh, I don't know if anybody noticed this as we were going through this, but once you got the speed of Larry there, four meters per second, we could have, without even doing this calculation, this formal calculation, predicted that uh, Ted was going to have um, Ted was going to have more kinetic energy. Okay, what's more important in the calculation of kinetic energy? Okay, speed or mass? Look, we got 40 and 6, 60 and 4. Okay, so they kind of go together there, right? What's more important though? Is it is it speed or is it mass? Speed. So the guy with the higher speed is going to have the higher kinetic energy, right? Okay, if the speed and the mass have to balance out in order to give the same momentum, then the one with the higher speed is the one that's going to have more kinetic energy because it's speed squared. All right? Does that make sense, guys? We didn't do very well on that question, but is it kind of clear how we did that? All right. We're going to do one new thing here, but it's not going to take us a long time at all. We're going to distinguish between two types of collisions. Up until now, we've addressed... Collisions, just collisions. If you've had a collision, 
there hasn't been more than one type. It's just been a collision. Okay? Now we're going to separate them into two types, elastic and inelastic collisions. In an elastic collision, momentum is still conserved. So it's still conserved in an inelastic collision as well. Momentum is always conserved in any collision, elastic or inelastic, as long as you have an isolated system. But in an elastic collision, kinetic energy is also conserved. But in an inelastic collision, kinetic energy is not conserved, i.e., kinetic energy is lost. You won't lose momentum in either collision. You will lose kinetic energy in the inelastic collision. Now, how do we know if a collision is elastic or inelastic? We can't find out by conservation of momentum because they're both indistinguishable from one another when we're talking about momentum. Well, there's one way that's a tried and true method that works for every single one. Calculate the kinetic energy before and after. If it's the same, it's elastic. If it's different, it's inelastic. But there's one other thing that's a shortcut that will sometimes tell us whether it's elastic or inelastic. If it's an elastic collision, the objects always bounce apart. In an inelastic collision, they sometimes stick together, sometimes bounce apart. So if you've got a collision in which they bounce apart, you don't know what it is without doing the calculations for kinetic energy. Because it could be elastic, where they always bounce apart, or it could be inelastic, where they still sometimes bounce apart. But if the two objects stick together in the collision, like those car problems where there's a collision and they entangle, if they, if they stick together, it must be inelastic. You don't even need to bother doing the calculation if they stick together. You know that it's going to be inelastic. Now, let me give you some examples of some inelastic and elastic collisions here. Okay. We know, first of all, that objects that stick together have to be involved in an inelastic collision. Two cars hit each other, okay, they stick together, they entangle, it's inelastic. You catch a ball, the ball and you become one object. Okay, that's an inelastic collision. Okay, you got a skateboard coming one way, you're running the other way, you jump on the skateboard and you and the skateboard become one object. That's an inelastic collision because you stick together. Okay, anytime you stick together, you've got an inelastic collision. Okay, bounce a basketball on the ground. Okay, the basketball bounces up, right? They bounce apart. That's still an inelastic collision. Two cars hit each other and they bounce apart. That's still an, an inelastic collision. What about an elastic collision? Well, truthfully, there's not very many examples of truly elastic collisions. The best example of an elastic collision that we can get on, an, on a macroscopic scale, in other words, a scale that we can see, would be something like two billiard balls hitting each other, bouncing apart, or two marbles hitting each other, bouncing apart. Those aren't truly elastic either, but they're very, very close. The reason they're close to elastic, but yet two cars bouncing off each other isn't close to elastic. It's because of a law that you learned in Science 10. You guys remember, does anybody remember, just on the off chance, the second law of thermodynamics from Science 10? No. <laughs> but that's good. That's, that was pretty good, actually. The, um, it says, Kenton, uh, that anytime you have an energy conversion, you lose a little bit of energy. You guys remember that? Anytime you convert energy from one type to another, you always lose a little bit. 
it's never 100% efficient. You always lose a little bit, typically in the form of heat, thermal energy. Make sense? When I bounce a basketball, can you picture the basketball bouncing in slow motion right now. When I bounce a basketball, the bounce the basketball hits the ground, the basketball compresses, right, dramatically. As the basketball compresses, kinetic energy of the basketball that it had just before the collision took place is converted to elastic potential energy. And then that elastic potential energy is converted back to kinetic as the ball goes back up into the air, and then into gravitational potential as it goes up into the air even further, right? There's lots of energy conversions taking place there. Okay, if there's energy conversions taking place, you're going to lose a little bit every time. Well, then you can never have as much kinetic energy after it's taken place as you did before, because you lost some whenever you had that conversion. It's got to be inelastic, because you've lost energy. Kinetic energy, that is. So why are two billiard balls really, really close to an elastic collision? Well, when two billiard balls hit each other, what happens to them? Do they squish like a basketball hitting the ground? No. If they don't squish, you don't get that conversion of energy taking place from kinetic to potential. And if you don't get that conversion taking place, you're not going to lose a whole lot of energy in the conversion process. So the kinetic energy that you have before the collision ends up being pretty much the same as the kinetic energy that you have after the collision. No loss of energy because no transformation. The only time you have a truly elastic collision where there is literally 0 0.0000000 joules of kinetic energy that's lost is when you have subatomic particles collided. Let's say two electrons hit each other and collided and bounced off. Why can that one be perfectly elastic? The billiard balls are close, but not perfect. Why could two electrons hitting each other be perfectly elastic? Remember, the basketballs hitting were inelastic because they squished, and there was an energy transformation between kinetic and elastic potential. The billiard balls were close to elastic because there wasn't much of a conversion taking place between kinetic and elastic potential. Two electrons hit each other. How much can they squish? The electron is as small as it can possibly get. It's a fundamental particle. How can you squish something that can't get smaller? Because there's no squishing taking place when the electrons hit or subatomic particles hit, okay, there's no loss of energy and transformation whatsoever. So in a situation like that, it would be perfectly elastic. Does that make sense? Okay. In the end, guys, it, it's not that hard. You don't have to necessarily remember all those different things that I've said. Okay. What you need to remember is that Calculate the kinetic energy before and after. If it's the same, it's elastic. If it's different, it's inelastic. Okay, whether you're talking about a subatomic particle or billiard balls or basketballs or cars, calculate the kinetic energy, and that will give you the answer. Okay, whether you remember why you know, the squishing and whatever has any, any bearing on it or not, doesn't really matter. Here's a little summary table. Two types of collisions, elastic and inelastic. Is kinetic energy conserved? Yes or no? Oh, sorry, is momentum conserved, I mean. Yes or no? Yes. Right here? In an inelastic collision, is momentum conserved? Yes. What about kinetic energy? Elastic. Yes or no? Yes. Inelastic? No. You will almost certainly see that question on your diploma exam. It probably won't be in the form of a table, although it could be. You're almost always asked in some way to distinguish between elastic and inelastic. You have to know that momentum will be conserved and that kinetic energy will, will sometimes be conserved. You know when it's conserved, it's when it's not. This last column is just probably not something that you'll be asked directly on an exam, but it will be something that may be a little trick for you sometime to help avoid a calculation, possibly. Do the objects bounce apart in an elastic collision? Yes, always. Do they bounce apart in an inelastic collision? Sometimes. Right? Sometimes they stick together, sometimes they bounce apart. So if you get a question where they bounce apart, 
you got to do the calculation to see for sure. If you get an object or a collision in which they stick together, you don't have to do a calculation because unless you're sold, justify it with a calculation. Okay, uh, you know it's got to be inelastic if they stick together. We're just going to do one fairly straightforward example, and then we're going to wrap it up for the day. And if there's any time left, you can work on the worksheet that's homework for Monday. Uh, page 482 says. A 0 0.160 kilogram billiard ball. Okay, right away we're we're probably predicting like, hey, this is going to be pretty close to elastic, right? 0 0.5 meters per second north strikes a stationary snooker ball, rebounds at that 0 0.0230 meters per second uh, to the south. Okay, so we got some different directions here. The snooker ball moves off at 0 0.465. Uh, determine whether it's elastic or inelastic. All right, let's call this. M1, let's call this M2. This is going to be V1I. Uh, this is going to be V2I, zero meters per second. The snooker ball, no wait, the billiard ball rebounds at 0 0.230. The billiard ball is traveling at this speed, strikes the snooker ball, and the billiard ball rebounds at 0 0.230. So we're going to make this V1F. And we're going to put in brackets there that it's negative. So we don't forget. This is going to be V2, V2F. Now, this is a collision. Conservation momentum applies. But I'm not trying to find out the final velocity or one of the masses. I'm trying to find out if it's elastic or inelastic. So I don't need to go through that process of PI equals PF here. Let's just calculate EKI. It's one half m1 v1i squared plus one half m2 v2i squared. The total kinetic energy. One half of 0 0.16 times 0 0.50 squared plus one half of 0.18 times 0 0.023 squared. Have I missed anything there? Have I done anything wrong? Have I left anything out? Yep. Good question. Does a 0 0.023 need to be negative? No. Why not? I just said it was negative right up here. I made a point. It was south. I wrote down that it was negative. I didn't want to forget that. Now we're saying it doesn't have to be negative? Why not? Somebody said it, not a vector. Okay. We know the velocity is to the self. If we were using that momentum, we'd need to use that. But this is kinetic energy. And kinetic energy uses speed, not velocity. And speed is a scalar. Right. I don't care if that, speed, that velocity is 0 0.023 meters per second at 38 degrees south of west. I don't care. Don't include the direction. Don't include the direction here. Just include the magnitude. So let's get a value for EKI there. Let's do that on the calculator here. Uh, together. Uh, let's say 0 0.5 times 0 0.16 times 0 0.5 squared. Let's press equals. And now let's add that to some brackets here. 0 0.5 times 0 0.18 times 0 0.023 squared. End brackets. I get 0 0.02005. So a little bit of kinetic energy there, not much. The final kinetic energy is 0 0.16 times um, oh, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. I made a mistake here. This is wrong. No, what's, what have I done wrong here? This is initial kinetic energy, right? The initial kinetic energy of the second object was zero, right? Does that make sense? Was anybody kind of thinking that and just kind of afraid to say it? 
So that number is going to be wrong there as well. What do we end up getting there now? Uh, uh, 0 0.02. The final kinetic energy is uh, 0 0.023, right? We're going to still drop the negative because it's still speed. We're just putting it in the right place now. The final speed of the second one was 0.465. So it's going to be 0.18 times 0.465 squared. I can promise you that number won't be greater than the initial kinetic energy. It'll either be the same or it'll be smaller. Let's figure it out here now. 0.5 times 0.16 times 0 0.023 squared. 0.5 times 0.18 times 0.465. Oops. Square the last term in there. Brackets. Okay, let's add those two together here. I uh, know we already did. We already did that in the beginning. Uh, 0 0.0195. Uh oh. They're really close, aren't they? Well, didn't I tell you something like pool balls would be? Because they don't squish very much, right? Okay, are they, so are they close enough to say it's elastic or not? Like, where's the cutoff, right? Sorry? No. Nope. Let's go with significant figures. How many sig figs should my final answer be rounded to for kinetic energy? Uh, one, two, three digits, right? Three digits everywhere? Okay, so let's say three digits here would be 0 0.0200 joules. Three digits here would be 0 0.195. Is it elastic? It's inelastic. Because the three digits, it's a different number. Now, if I had been given the, the mass of the billiard ball as 0 0.16, this point is supposed to 0 0.160, then my final answer would have been rounded to two digits. I would have got 0 0.020 and the other one would have been rounded to 0 0.020. Then we would have said, then we would have said it's elastic. Right? To that number of digits, we would have said it's elastic. Good? All right, do you guys feel okay about that? Okay, so um, Bell's going to go in just a moment here, so you don't need to bother hauling out your worksheet now. That worksheet is due on. Monday. What I would like you to do with that worksheet, please, is uh, um, do what, you know what? I was going to have you do something else. Never mind. Just do the questions as they're phrased there, okay? And then we'll uh, do another example of this tomorrow. Okay. Quiz tomorrow, remember, on conservation of momentum, not on elastic and elastic collisions, just straightforward conservation of momentum. And of course, your lab is due tomorrow as well.